Good morning. My name is Jim DeWald. I'm the Dean of the Haskane School of Business and very pleased to be uh, MC in this event. Let me start with the territorial acknowledgement. I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the traditional territories of the peoples of Treaty 7, which include the Blackfoot Confederacy, comprised of the Sitsika, the Pakani, and the Gainai First Nations, the Sutina First Nation, and the Stony Nakoda, which includes the Chiniki, Bears Paw, and Good Stony First Nations. The city of Calgary is also home to the Métis Nation of, Re of Alberta, Region 3. Please take a moment to uh, acknowledge the territories where you may be from, um, and certainly uh, the territory, uh, the Treaty 7 territories that we were on. Welcome to the Enbridge Research and Action Seminar Series. Um, today, we are speaking about how Canadian firms, you know, generally outperform American firms environmentally, but is that actually a good thing? Does that give you financial benefits? I can't wait to hear what the, uh, what the panel has to say on this. I want to thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, we're delighted that you chose to join us. Um, on this very engaging topic. And I want to mention that this uh, series brings together, the unique thing about it is it brings together influential researchers, practitioners, and industry experts to discuss leading edge sustainability research. Now, our last Enbridge Research in Action uh, seminar, entitled The Role of Collaboration in the Energy Transition, discussed how Canadian ingenuity, leadership, and collaboration can help us get to net zero the way forward with new technologies. So I want to acknowledge and take this opportunity to acknowledge our friends at Enbridge. Enbridge's support is uh, helping to build learning environments for future leaders, advance innovation, and engage our community. Uh, we are incredibly grateful for the partners like Enbridge, who recognize the important role collaboration plays between post-secondary institutions and business community at large. Thank you to Enbridge. Okay, so uh, there will be time for questions at the end of today's event, but let me start by giving a very brief introduction to each of our panelists. Uh, right beside me is our moderator, Niels Vers uh, Versfield, and Niels is a Senior Director of Environment at MBC Group, but you know what? To me, that doesn't matter much because he's also one of our students. He's a Doctor of Business Administration student, so uh, welcome, Niels. Uh, beside him is uh, Janet Ainsley, who is the Chief Sustainability Officer at Kiwitano uh, Energy. And beside her is Dr. Yuri Koskinen, uh, the BMO Professor in Sustainable Finance at the Haskane School of Business. So I'm just going to hand it over to Niels, and uh, let's uh, let, please join me in welcoming our panel. Great. Uh, thanks, Jim. All right. Uh, well, let's get right into it. Yorio, tell us about the study. Uh, what was the real problem you were trying to solve, and what did you find? Well, thank you, Niels, and uh, Janet. Nice to be in the panel, panel, panel with you to, uh, this morning, and nice to see so many people here today, despite the rain, rainy, rainy weather. It's certainly better than the smoky weather. Uh, so, if you are not academic, you don't realize that we finance academics, even in Canada. We spend more of, most of our lives looking at... Uh, American markets. So most of our careers are built around studying American markets. And the assumption is if it's true in the, in the US, it must be true everywhere else. So buying really into this U American imperialism. Uh, that if, if it's true in America, it has to be true in every, elsewhere. But then is, is this necessarily the case? So we, we started thinking about that. Uh, there's ample evidence uh, that uh, in many, many cases, ESG, so environmental social governance issues, create value, financial value in the United States. So if firms engage in ESG initiatives, they get either higher stock prices, lower cost of capital, uh, maybe higher profits, and uh, 
there is a lot of really good evidence that is really the case in the United States. Then the question is that, hey, does it really apply to Canada? I mean, we, we share the same legal heritage, common law. We are next to the, the United States, and we often think that we are very, very similar to the United States. But is that really the case? And um, when we started looking into the issue that uh, how does and uh, of course, our study is not about ESG, it's just about the environmental performance. Because there have been so many studies about ESG, and everybody knows that on how do you compare E to S to G. So we just decided to concentrate on the E, the environmental part, because that's more, really more, more tangible and right, right now so, so topical. So then we started looking into it. Does this positive financial results also apply to Canada? And to somehow, so just, I must say, say that to a surprise. No, it doesn't seem to be the case that engaging in environmental activities create value, financial value in, in Canada. I mean, you have to make sure that, I mean, environmental initiatives create value, maybe social value for the environment, but we were looking originally as to does it create financial value. So in the United States, and even in our study, like in myriad other studies, uh, environmental activities increase, uh, valuation multiples for, for US firms, increase profits. In our study, no impact on, on the risk of the firm, in, although previous studies, including some of my previous studies, have found that yes, the risk is also diminished. But there's clear evidence, even in our study, that the US firms benefit financially. But there is no evidence for Canada. And in the, some of our results, we even see negative results that uh, engaging in environmental activities destroys financial value in Canada. I perhaps wouldn't go that far. I would just say that there is no evidence that, that at least in our data, that um, environmental activities, environmental performance creates financial value, no impact on profits, maybe slight negative impact on valuation multiples, maybe might be even in some of our results increasing risk, which is kind of really, really uh, astonishing that the results for Canada and US are so different. Yeah, agreed. Definitely interesting and I think surprising to a lot of people. Um, Janet, from your perspective as someone who's worked in business, government, and also uh, nonprofit organizations, what in the study spoke to you? Well, I, I read the study a couple times. And so the first time I read it, I tried to read it really with, you know, the, I'd say the intellectual analytical part of my brain about, you know, how you'd set the study up, its methodology, et cetera. And then when I read it last night, I read it really with the emotional part of my brain, and I got really angry. <laughs> because I think, you know, exactly as, as Yuri described, um, you know, for, for those of us who have worked really hard in organizations uh, that have been taught, you know, that risk management uh, will create value, that if you reduce the risks as associated with environmental issues, safety, uh, process safety, occupational safety, and have, uh, you know, really good uh, social performance. You know, I spent 10 years at Shell, and there's a whole discipline in non-technical risk management. And uh, to, to hear that this is, for Canadian firms, is not creating value, even though, as Yuri points out, we have better environmental performance than U.S. firms, is really frustrating. Um, because you know, we're, we do, we open, we open the Wall Street Journal or we read the New York Times or CNN and uh, FT and we're, we're told that there's a lot of capital out there looking for ESG or environmentally sustainable investment opportunities. And so, you know, we, we tune our businesses to try to access that capital and have that competitive advantage. But I, the study shows that that, that, that study, that, that competitive advantage doesn't actually exist. In fact, you know, as you say, if it actually is, there's some evidence that it could be towards the negative, is uh, exactly the wrong message, I think, that, you know, uh, the business community, you know, and I think we'll get into it about, you know, maybe that's not, you know, the, the final message that we should all take away, but it, it's frustrating. And the, com the competitive implications, I think, for everyone in the room are clear. We all compete with U.S. firms for capital, for resources, uh, for if you're in the energy industry in particular, for markets. 
And if U.S. firms have this competitive advantage where they are able to derive more value, create more value um, out of environmental performance, well, you know, that's great. I'm really, that's, that's good for them. That's good for the planet. That's good overall. But there should be a call to action, I think, for us uh, in terms of how do we um, create the superior returns uh, out of this kind of uh, environmental performance that we clearly do have. Um, you know, in MBA school, I was taught that competitive advantage, you know, Michael Porter's competitive forces, um, you know, a lot of these are very self-sustaining, that once a, a firm or an industry gets out ahead and they have lower cost of capital, uh, they uh, have better profits, they have an ongoing access to advantaged resources, they can innovate better than others, they can differentiate better than others. So I think this is a real wake-up call that we should be heeding and looking at how we can uh, use environmental performance, not simply just to manage risk, but to create opportunities. Great. Um, so I guess we've, we've identified it's clearly kind of an issue with this mismatch, right, needing the environmental performance, but not getting that financial benefit. So let's kind of unpack it and understand why. Why do you think you um, got these results? I guess we didn't discuss this, but were you also surprised yourself um, with the results? And just uh, what are the reasons behind do you think? So, I, so I, I was absolutely surprised to see uh, this has been, I mean, we, we looked at the data uh, already a couple of years ago, but we didn't do any systematic studies. So then, then, okay, then we started really slicing and dicing that there has to be something here. So our first idea is that, uh, okay, the industrial composition in Canada is so different than the United States. So we are commodities, resource-based economy, U.S. economies, is high-tech intangibles. So then, okay, let's, let's now match Canadian energy firms to U.S. energy firms, Canadian mining firms to U.S. mining firms, and, and uh, let's compare. The results are still there. Not as strong, so there's this little bit, of, little bit behind this the different industrial composition. But you, even U.S. energy firms, U.S. mining firms, U.S. resource firms seem to be give, creating more value out of uh, environmental initiatives, financial value out of en environmental initiatives. Right now, uh, and I, one thing that I would like to, like to really study, but we don't have good data f as of yet, is to look at uh, how can uh, Canadian firms better differentiate uh, their business strategies using environmental or ESG initiatives. That would be the kind of the obvious next step, to looking at, uh, and then perhaps, perhaps maybe a finance guy is not the right person to, maybe it should be a marketing person who should be the study or, or, or strategy person. How do we can use ESG strategies to differentiate? But that kind of should be kind of the natural follow-up studies. But the answer that we came in this study is that the differences in, uh, 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 between U.S. And, and Canada is due to co the difference in corporate governance system. So since the 2008 uh, Supreme Court decision of BCI and the debenture holders, uh, Canadian corporate governance has been more stakeholder oriented. So the fiduciary duty in Canada, I've, I mean, you, you go to downtown Calgary and everything, we have a fiduciary duty to shareholders. Well, that's not, the, that's not the Canadian law. Even the Canadian corporate business law has changed lately. The Canadian business law and, and the Supreme Court decision say that the fiduciary duty is to the corporation as a whole. Whereas we usually think that the United States is a very stakeholder-oriented country. And in, in general, that is true. Except that also in the United States, 35 states have adopted so-called constituency statutes. So 35 states, including big states like uh, California, Massachusetts, uh, however, not Delaware, where most, most of the U.S. Co corporations are incorporated. But big states have also uh, inco uh, adopted constituency statutes, which say that uh, companies incorporated in those states may take other stakeholder interests into consideration. So kind of co closer to Canadian corporate governance. And when we study separately those companies that come from these Constitution statute states, their results are getting closer to Canadian results, so that they don't create as much value as, as companies that come from really stakeholder-oriented states. So I think there, there is something to that difference in, 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 in 
corporate governance. In the United States, ESG initiatives or environmental initiatives are really business decisions. This is we want to create value with these initiatives. In Canada, perhaps the motivation is that we want to do good for the society. And, and, the, and then they shows in the, in, the, in the financial results. Great, lots of questions you could probably ask out of that, but uh, we'll pass it back to Janet. In your experience, um, or, yeah, what, what kind of, why do you think the reasons, the results came out here? Well, I, I think there's a, I, again, Yuri he did a very good job of speaking to some of the key differences that drive some of the, the reasons. Um, and I think the, I mean, America is America, and they have a long history of uh, being able to really think more like marketers. And when I say marketers, I don't mean, you know, kind of, you know, TV ads necessarily, but uh, looking at where you can develop a competitive advantage, like what sort of systems uh, are needed, and how do you turn entire systems towards um, society's goals? Uh, be it a war effort, be it, you know, um, you know, uh, right now I think as we look in Canada for net zero 2035 electricity, you know, often people in the government talk to me about, well, this is, you know, kind of like the Manhattan Project. We have to kind of get on with it. And the U.S. has a great legacy of doing that, and I think they've doubled down with the recent Inflation Reduction Act. And, uh, you know, whereas we in Canada tend to use a stick, uh, we want to punish companies for bad behavior, we don't think enough, and you know, I was in government, so uh, you know, I think through carbon taxes, that was you know part of the uh, regime that uh, we were looking at at Natural Resources and Environment Canada, and uh, got across the goal line as a national carbon price because you can actually start to create that economic incentive for for good behavior, not just the disincentive for for bad behavior. But then we sort of leave it there. We don't follow through. And we don't push it all the way through into our, our markets by creating the developing markets, growing markets for low carbon products, for example, so that uh, there would actually be a, a premium, an incentive for a company to, to sell a market, to sell a product into those markets. Um, even in our financial system, and you know, I, I do think, of course, the I don't know if it's finance professors, but the finance system has a huge opportunity and role to play. You know, uh, even as companies, I think many in this room maybe have sustainability-linked loans. And what kind of advantage do you really get from that? If you've got top drawer environmental performance, social performance, you've got great diversity, equity, inclusion in your company, or, you know, checking all of the boxes, you might get 50 basis points, which really isn't enough in a small company or on a small loan to try to drive that kind of... Um, that kind of behavior. So how do we actually get a meaningful uh, advantage for firms that are, who are clearly demonstrating performance? And what kind of capital is out there that is willing to, to pay for that? I think at a certain point it will become table stakes, and maybe that's the way it is in Canada at present, that we, and that's why our environmental performance is, um, is, is high, is because we have great systems of regulation. We're oftentimes very I think modest in terms of how um, we're regulated in this country. And as you mentioned, our stakeholder orientation to try to create value for stakeholders across society. But we really have to get smart or we're gonna get left behind. And uh, our neighbor to the south has given us a wake up call. That happens sometimes. Um, I, I, we didn't discuss this, but I'm gonna follow on. I was just thinking it's interesting because from the investor side, you've had a lot of investor facing. It's not like Canadian companies are just invested by Canadian investors and vice versa. So why do you think the same investors are maybe giving credit to the U.S. companies but not the Canadian companies? And whoever wants to take that first. Let me, let me first, uh, Janet raised the issue of, of branding and marketing. I think that's also one of the keys that I mean, America is very good at storytelling. U.S. companies are very good at marketing, branding. Canada has traditionally been a commodities business society where, where kind of branding and differentiation haven't been that important. I mean, oil is oil is oil, whereas if, if you have a consumer goods, you, branding is essential. So I think we need to get, a, we need to get a better at branding in this country and creating value out of our differentiation. 
the, the financial question, like Janet alluded, there, there are some financial benefits, like 50 basis points, and that's actually quite big, because sometimes in stu some studies you only see five basis points difference. So there is some financial benefits of sustainable loans or, or, or green loans, for example. Uh, but, I mean, there's a huge fixed cost in setting up credible environmental uh, programs. And maybe the 50 basis points for a, for a, a mid-sized company is not, not enough. And maybe going forward, there might be a, uh, better financial, really much better financial terms uh, uh, for, for uh, let's say, as clean uh, oil or as clean as natural gas as possible. Uh, but it's, it's always going to be differ, um, difficult to differentiate in, in the commodities business. Are, are people willing to pay more for, for green, the greenest possible natural gas versus just a standard natural gas? That's, 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 that's a very difficult challenge. I can see for, for let's say, if consumer goods, uh, environmental performance is a, is a great differentiator. But Canada is not a big producer of consumer goods. So, and that's, a, I mean, the U.S. is very good at that. Do you want to speak to differentiation of commodities, or uh... yeah, well, well, you know, it's it's the differentiating. I think you hit the nail on the head. I mean, the the differentiation of commodities is incredibly difficult. Uh, again, I spent ten years with Shell, and maybe there's some Shell uh, current or uh, former employees in the room. But I remember I worked in the downstream, and which is includes the retail outlets, and it's it's quite hilarious. Canadians, unlike Americans, will make like we always said an illegal left across four lanes of traffic and a and a double solid line to save a, a tenth of a cent per liter on gasoline. <laughs> like we've got, but so it's really that's our differentiator is price on 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 a commodity when you're going to fill in your tank. You know, put put it's not you know maybe if you drive a sports car, you know Shell would do a lot of the Shell Team Ferrari and you know uh, uh, Formula One to try to really differentiate that that high and um, part of their, their gasoline, but it's really tough to differentiate in the commodities business. And in the U.S., more people are, you know, are willing to pay extra. Uh, I think we're seeing the same thing with clean uh, electricity. And we've got to think, though, on a more macro market scale. And, you know, again, just an example um, that we were talking about before this is the new clean electricity regulations are, you know, I think we would all agree we need to move towards net zero in our electricity system. Um, but when you look at the standard that the government has currently introduced, it's a strict standard. There's no compliance mechanisms by buying credits if you, if you have a new facility. You just have to meet the standard. So number one, that undermines your carbon markets. Number two, there's not the actual, uh, for producers of clean electricity or up the value chain to cleaner natural gas that has lower methane, you're not actually necessarily getting an advantage by doing those things. The government hasn't the consistency of policy throughout uh, the the system isn't there to create those uh, layering of financial incentives so you can create the value that you need at the end of the day. But I think it would be what maybe investors are frankly missing in some cases. And as I thought about this example, I was really struggling to find Canadian firms who were doing this because although it's being done in Canada, it's being done by foreign firms. So I think about major projects that have uh, gone ahead. Um, you know, I've had a lot of experience in major projects, from the Athabasca oil sands project uh, at Shell to being in government and looking at LNG projects, pipelines, etc. And I think in every single case I can think of, the reason why really game-changing projects like LNG Canada, uh, you know, the Athabasca oil sands from Shell, which was approved in uh, 1999, so 24 years ago. Uh, went ahead was because they did differentiate on environmental performance. They did differentiate on social performance to get regulatory approvals, to get the confidence of their boards and of investors that a financial investment decision could be de-risked and taken, that you weren't going to end up with, you know, you had solid Indigenous partnerships or Indigenous benefits agreements. You knew what the fiscal regime was going to be because either it was clear in, in policy or because you had a bespoke deal with the government. Uh, to, to cover your, your exact investment. Uh, or, you know, governments had created policies like with uh, the oil sands, the accelerated capital ca cost allowance and the royalty regime that, that created that. But at Shell, I think the only reason in, in 1999 the Athabasca oil sands project got across the line 
um, was because we had a voluntary greenhouse gas emissions reduction target. We had uh, done extensive work with the Fort Mackay First Nation and other members of the Athabasca Tribal Council to have local and indigenous uh, contracting. So that created billions, tens of billions of dollars in value. Um, you know, the firms that went on not only to harvest the, um, the cash um, uh, flow from those projects, there were smaller firms involved that had their share price um, significantly uh, increase and eventually it was sold. So I think we've got um, really good track records, but oftentimes in the more, what concerns me is in today's world is we're not seeing Canadian firms. Where are the Syncrudes, the great Canadian oil sands, the Hibernias, the, 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 the Canadian firms that are really investing in these projects? Instead, what we see is oftentimes either American firms or, you know, more and more firms from Asia, like, you know, Mitsubishi or uh, Patronus. And a lot of times, I think they're just seeing that there's, in addition to potentially a financial upside, they're more interested in the security of doing business in Canada, the security of energy supply. So I think we have to ask that question is, you know, uh, the message again is not, you know, there's no value in environmental performance, because clearly this, there, there is. You know, when I look back and, you know, on, on the pipeline decisions the government had to take in 2016 and 2015, a lot of the differentiator for the projects that went ahead, namely TMX, was that they had such good environmental and stakeholder relations and indigenous relations. So don't take the message, please, that don't do any of this stuff because it's not adding value. Um, in order to even get the opportunity, I think, to, to play, to be in the game, you need to do it. Good point, and like you said, Canadian firms do have better performance in, in the study, right? So it's, um, we've already improved that performance, right? And, and maybe even captured some of that value, like you said, in creating projects and kind of that almost go or no go. Um, so I guess kind of so what is the question as far as the study, to your point? Um, you know, does, do we just give up with environmental performance because it doesn't help shareholder value? or? Um, what should change? What do we do with corporate governance? Should the U.S. change? Um, I don't know if we can address that here. That's but a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> I guess, Janet, will, will this research change your day to day? It will. It actually will. I think I, it gives me um, some more resolve, actually, to, um, to really uh, think about how to differentiate strategically. And, um, you know, uh, I'm, I currently work at a company called Kuitno Energy, and we're a, a, a built-for-purpose uh, uh, energy transition company. And uh, we've had a lot of discussions about differentiation, and Pat Carlson, uh, our CEO, is, is really big on differentiation. And very, very um, strong on our strategy as well, that uh, we even had a, a meeting yesterday where we were talking about you know, some of our own concerns about our share price and uh, do we feel we're fully valued in the market and what can we do to change that? But after we talked for three hours, we came back to the fact that we believe we've got a competitive advantage in our business strategy. But we do need to differentiate and we do need to communicate clearly and that's where it comes back to, you know, say this simplistically, but it comes back to investor relations, it comes back to communication, it even comes back to talking to governments to say, if you want this energy transition to happen, here's how you need to be thinking about how to create the right incentives to create the value. Don't be afraid. We're so afraid of, in Canada that if somebody makes a profit off of the energy transition, uh, you know, that somehow this is a, a bad thing. We actually have to create, um, you know, maybe not, I can't remember the price tag in the U.S., I think it was like one point, it was, I don't know, trillions, trillions of dollars for, I think it's uncapped for the IRA in the, in, the, in the U.S., but we need to start to think big, systematically. We can't get uh, bogged down in, as we were talking before this, you know, bespoke individual negotiations for contracts for difference, that we need to have certainty around enough of our financial equation for the energy transition that we can make it happen. So I just, I'm more resolved that it can be done and more studies like this. I congratulate uh, you on the research and I think there's much, much more to do. Great. Um, 
I guess, Yurio, how can this research help support business strategy and as well for policymakers? What, what does it mean to them and how should they take the research? So I think uh, the, the key message that I would like to say is that uh, uh, environmental initiatives should be looked at as a, as a business issue in Canada. So think about really hard how you can uh, make environmental issues part of your strategy and how you can create value by embedding it really as a fundamental part of your strategy, not as a kind of, oh, we, we have to do this environmental project on the, on the side desk. They have to be embedded in the, in the strategy, have to be embedded in the differentiation strategy. And in a commodities business, it's, it's not obvious. It's, it's a tough, tough business challenge. But that's why CEOs get big, pay, big, get big, big, big bucks to figure out these tough, tough decisions. And um, like Janet said, that, that, I mean, it's, it's no, no shame of making money out of environmental initiatives. It's, it's a win-win for the environment, win-win for, for, for the companies if the environment wins, if, if, if companies win. And in order to really have a energy transformation and, 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 and uh, moving to low carb economy, it has to be in the best interest of the corporations. Otherwise, it's, it's, it, the magnitudes are not going to be there. But if, if your self-interest is, is on your side, then things really start happening. If you, if you figure out how to make money out, out of uh, environmental performance. And of course, like Janet said, that if you have to have certain standards. If you, if you don't work with indigenous uh, uh, nations, if you don't have methane, uh, regulations, if you don't have uh, reduce your carbon footprint, you won't be in the energy business. So you, you have to fulfill certain standards. So everybody needs to have environmental performance metrics. But going beyond those uh, minimum standards, right now it doesn't seem to be the case that it creates value, but it, it could create value when you figure out how to, how to really differentiate it, how to brand it, and how, you, how, how to tell your story so that investors realize that, oh my God, uh, uh, this, is, uh, this is something good is happening. I mean, I, I don't want to mention the company, but Niels, we, we talked about one, one particular company that has actually very good environmental performance, but the company doesn't tell it to, to, tell it to anybody. It doesn't even report to the, the ESG uh, uh, metrics to the, the ESG rating agencies. And I think that that's kind of, uh, that's, that's craziness. Yeah, yeah, interesting for sure, that, that example. Uh, before we get to the questions, I, I guess what, and on the hope side, one thing we discussed is you didn't look at the distribution of those the results, right? So it might just be the average that it hasn't helped Canadian firms, but some firms, like you speak, might have got, got value because of the good performance and were able to market and some weren't. I guess, can you speak to that a bit, Ariel? Would that be a next step to look at for yeah, individual we, 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 firms to think about it? Yeah, we would like to look at the a little bit the really, really contrast the low performance versus high performance. A little bit more detail study in that respect. And, uh, and really, I mean, what needs to be done is to really maybe, I don't know, maybe quantitative studies are not the right way to go. Maybe we should have more qualitative studies looking into how is, uh, let's say, environmental performance embedded in the business strategy. So we need multiple approaches to figure, it, figure this out. Data can only tell so much. And, 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 and uh, maybe sometimes data is incomplete, so you don't get into the need to create details just looking at the quantitative data. Yeah, because when you were talking, I was curious then, are the American firms doing different initiatives? Right? Or is it for the same initiative, they're just better at marketing it? And that's, that's a detail that would be hard to see in your current study, right, I assume? And I would assume in some cases there's more confidence by investors that a certain in investment has been made in environmental performance because there's going to be a return, not because it was required as a regulation or, you know, didn't really differentiate the firm, you know, that it, it was done to differentiate the firm and create value. Going to that table stakes kind of idea as well. Um, okay, well, I think the idea was to keep it interactive, so we've got uh, about 20 minutes of questions here. Oh, great, perfect. So, from my perspective, I, I, I've heard so many times that ESG needs to be coupled with I, and an objective I being indigenous. 
Some of the most rapidly approved projects being Cedar LNG and Wood Fiber LNG are, they are, uh, have been approved on environmental impact assessments that have been indigenous, uh, um, uh, built by the indigenous communities. That to me seems like a pretty obvious factor on why Canadian firms aren't unlocking the ESG is because there's this I component that does not resonate with the indigenous communities that are and have consent mechanisms on whether projects go forward or not. Could I just have some comments on that? You're exactly right. I think the um, key differentiator um, for the Trans Mountain project, and you know, a very complicated project because of a long linear project, though, was. Um, as well as there was opposition from indigenous uh, groups closer to the coast, there was a lot of support. And there was um, really clear benefits that the um, project proponent, and again, you know, at the time that they were you know, uh, proposing the project, it was a, an American firm, but they had really gone you know, uh, community to community, uh, opening doors, uh, making uh, deals, and uh, there, was, there was tremendous support. Uh, again, there wasn't universal support, um, but you're you're right. I mean, there's um, huge opportunity, and I think we're also not really clear in this country. Um, last week, I was in Ottawa, and uh, so was the major First Nations major project coalition. A number of companies in this room, in fact, I think including Enbridge, um, was was there um, talking to policymakers about how to really create the commercial opportunity for First Nations in all sorts of fields, but namely resource development and through major projects. And again, we just don't really, we're not clear about how to create that, that commercial opportunity in Canada. I think in the US, this would be figured out by now, that somebody would come in with, or the government would just come in and say, we're gonna create a, a fund, uh, say, throw out a number, $100 billion of loan guarantees, so that indigenous uh, First Nations, uh, Métis Nations can come in and get a stake in a project and can have the capacity as well to work with businesses to find the projects that are going to deliver the type of return and the area that they want to be invested in. So we've got a lot of work to do on that. But I, there is progress, but more people have to look at those shining lights of examples of what worked. And, and we also have to go to government so we can do the rest and create more value in this country. And of course, unfortunately, the indigenous issues are not that much of a big deal in the United States. It's much, much bigger here. And, it's, and of course, in the energy space, you, you don't have a project unless you deal with indigenous issues. In the US, uh, the prob they probably doesn't matter that much at all. And maybe that also reflects in, the, in the how investors behave. So that if you're an investor in, in New York or Houston, it doesn't. It might be not even in your radar. So maybe there's a, maybe companies could educate investors that these indigenous issues that we, if you don't deal with them, we don't have a project, and we don't have a business. So they have they, they are a necessity and they have to be recognized. Uh, and then well, what's I think the nice thing is is that. Uh, we probably in Canada, of course, if you are successful in incorporating environmental performance in a way that creates value, of course you want to keep it as a secret because you don't want to share your, 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 your secret sauce. To, uh, yeah. But on the other hand, it would be nice that if, if Canadian companies could learn from each other. So how do how this uh, company makes money? Do, do I, could I do something different? Could I do something similar? So kind of, uh, I mean, it's, it's, for a finance guy, it's kind of, okay, you, advocating for case studies and, and qualitative research is, is something that we usually don't do. But uh, as a finance scholar, you really can't get to the nitty gritty of business decision making. You just look at the data and look at financial markets. But we need, we need scholars for, for management strategy, marketing, entrepreneurship, looking at these issues as well. Great. Uh, hi there. Uh, I'll just stand here so I'm not uh, I don't have my back to anyone here, especially because I, I, I guess um, I want to offer like a call to action in in connection to what I've heard today. And thank you for thank you for the remarks. Lots of thought provoking and, and good content here. My name is Lior. I'm uh, 
I run a national organization called Canadian Business for Social Responsibility. We work with uh, companies in lots of different sectors across the economy. And my call to action is let's double down, actually. Let's not be afraid of this data that's saying we're not uh, yet seeing the economic benefit from having the, uh, the, the regulations and the, the mandate to, to pursue more on environment. There is a delay in doing this, these things, and so much of this is new. The, the whole ESG space, especially in the investment world, is really emerging. And investors, which you know, I'm in touch with a lot of them who are investing uh, all across the economy, are looking, and, and, they're, and the, the challenge of looking at just the environment versus the entire ESG space is that many companies are very good at articulating how the investments they're making into social impact or investments they're making into uh, environmental performance leads to problem solving, leads to tangible impacts. And I do think that oftentimes companies are approaching this challenge from a risk management point of view. I don't want to get caught doing the wrong thing. I don't want to, to be embarrassed, so I'm going to do what the law tells me I need to do in this particular way, even though there may be some bureaucratic hurdles. If you kind of like push those issues aside and say, we want to achieve something really ambitious and solve these problems. And in Canada, we have a number of them, right? Like decoupling, decarbonization from, from economic growth is a major challenge. Scope, th scope three, we haven't even touched that. Uh, the, the indigenous issues, of course, like these are, these are Canada's challenges. By solving the challenges, then we can actually tell a differentiated story to the market of saying, we're not afraid of regulations, we're not afraid of being overregulated. What we're afraid of is not solving the problems. And so that's, that's, my, that's my challenge to everyone in the room today. Let's, let's double down and recommit to that. Thanks. Great. I guess on that note, Ariel, you think if you looked at ESG versus just E, you would get a different result? And that touch, touches a little bit to the indigenous side as well. So actually, in, in, in the, our paper, we also have some ES results because we wanted to double check. This, is, is there a resource difference from E versus E and S? This is, they seem to be pretty much the same. So I don't think it's a, it's a question of... You, uh, comparing E versus ESG, I think this, the results would be pre, would be the same. Uh, but I, I, I can uh, uh, I can agree with your sentiment that this is this is an issue that the Canada needs to figure out. This is a call for action, and uh, but it's not easy. I want to say so. If somebody says, "Oh, ESG always creates value," no, oh, it always doesn't create value, financial value. Uh, so you, as a business people, you need to think really, really hard and figure it out how you're gonna make money out of this. Or if you not get, 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 uh, create financial value for your shareholders, then be honest about it, that, that this, is, this is good for the society, good for the environment, it's gonna cost us some uh, money, but I, we believe that in 2050 it will pay off, that financial markets are myopic, they don't understand that, but then you have to make the case that oh, investors are maybe a little bit short, short term, is even, Short term is that they don't understand that, okay, there's a big, big risk coming down the line in, in 20, 30 years, and we're preparing for that. So that, that could be a case that could be made. That, uh, I mean, I'm a, as a CEO, or uh, I'll see that with this risk uh, emerging, you as a finance, uh, fin investment manager, you haven't really thought about this as hard as, as we have. Uh, hello. Um, so one of the things I heard was kind of on the product uh, differentiation there and um, you know kind of in my experience Alberta can be good at commodity differentiation uh, with our Alberta beef uh, which cost me more for a steak at Salt Lake or the Guild um, what would be the main barrier for people in this room in getting together to establish a higher value product in something like Alberta certified natural gas uh, that may lead to mutually beneficial returns for everybody well, such a thing exists. I'm just looking around. Is Jen Turner here? There she is. Okay. So Jen is with EO100, <laughs> Equitable Origin 100, which it does, you know, certified natural gas along not just the E, and I think that's a, a differentiator for uh, EO100, is they're not just looking at uh, methane reductions. They're looking at uh, social um, criteria and impacts as well. 
Uh, really fascinating um, opportunity. Uh, the, the challenge, I think, is, you know, through the networks, and there's a number of different, um, so this isn't a complete ad for Jen Turner in, in EO100. Uh, you know, Jen has competitors uh, in, the, in that uh, area, and they're, they're uh, whether it's OGMP or MIQ, I'm going to throw a bunch of acronyms. Um, but there's, there's some really cool things happening when, when some buyers out there of natural gas are looking for the differentiated product, because usually they're in markets where that matters to their customer. Either um, they're, say, a massive power generator in Japan or um, in, you know, I'd, I'd like to see personally more in the U.S. and maybe even Ontario, where they're looking at Alberta natural gas, that we have um, stricter methane controls, that we have better uh, social performance, and that there's a third party like one of these firms to give us a, a ranking and to... Uh, somehow assign a value to that so that they're looking for our product and they're willing to pay, and I think it's more clear on methane reductions, they're willing to pay um, a premium. And there's new, new technology, digital twin certificates, et cetera, out there that are uh, interesting ways of, of rewarding producers of natural gas for uh, some of those investments that they're making in, say, methane reductions or uh, indigenous business partnerships, et cetera, et cetera. But we really have to double down. And I think there's, I've said before that, you know, if we, um, if we could work more, frankly, with potentially our own regulator in Alberta, maybe even with the federal government to really clearly articulate where the better performance is. We all, as, as oil and gas producers, put so much data into the AER. And I keep wanting to just be able to press a button and get a report that tells me what quartile I'm in in performance. And we got to start to think about how we harness the data. We we're talking about data, and the US has better data. How do we make the data that we do have more transparent and accessible so that we can actually assess who should be differentiated in the market? Irio, I don't know if you want to address that directly, but I guess I was thinking you, you spoke about splitting up in sectors in your study, and we've been talking about the resource and energy sector a lot. But what about Canadian consumer goods companies? Did you see the same effect, or is, is it we're, we're talking about it like it's related to industry, but did you find that in your study? So we, we didn't look at different industries. We just uh, controlled for industry, and then we matched Canadian firms to U.S. firms for, based on industry and size and profitability, just to control for the differences in the two economies. So the problem in looking at uh, different sectors in, in, in Canada is that there are not that many companies. You, s you start lo losing statistical power. So then you, I, I think, uh, then, uh, then we perhaps should use different methods of looking at these, more, maybe more, more qualitative studies in st and uh, to complement the quantitative studies. Uh, these, these issues are, are fairly complex. I mean, if, if it was easy, everybody would do it already. So, I mean, this, so, so this is a nice challenge. Uh, and it requires a lot of thought and how do, how do you create value? And uh, it's, it's, it's never supposed to be that easy to be a good, 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 good business leader and good CEO. Uh, so this is, this is fine. I mean, that's, 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 why, that's why people are compensated for, for, for figuring out how, tough problems. And same applies to academia. I mean, tough problems are the, the most interesting ones to figure out. And, uh, the, the role of a scholar is not to be the role of an advocate. You have to be kind of on it. Whatever comes out, comes out. And, and, and if, if you, you have to be able to defend your results. So you're not going to say, say that, oh my god, I'm not going to publish these results because this might be bad for ESG. No, your, your job is to tell that, okay, this is what I found, and then let's figure out the way forward. Maybe there is a way of creating value rather than say that the ESG always creates value, which is, in the Canadian case, is not true. And in, even in the U.S. case, it's not true. It has to be part of the differentiation strategy. So uh, there are ways of making, because uh, in, in a sense, our results are the average results. That uh, this is that's what, what happens to the marginal or the marginal firm. Uh, there are some firms that are losing money. There are some firms that are making money. And then the, fig the challenge is to figure out how you're going to make money out of these environmental initiatives. Yeah, good, good morning. Uh, in Canada, the emitting companies will pay a carbon tax. In, in the States, without said carbon tax, they can do these like pretty interesting schemes where companies like Microsoft 
will charge themselves a carbon tax of $30 a ton. They then keep that money. And it is, so first of all, they can say they're doing this carbon tax, but they keep the money to fund their own green projects. So like golf clap all around, but it, this is not the same thing, right? So, but coming ahead is, and if we look wider uh, outside of North America, you get something like Europe with this carbon border adjustment tax. So is Canada ahead if we're thinking about how this is coming? Or how do we then, uh, how do we then shift to know that uh, this is coming and may include the states, Canada and Europe? Uh, are we in a better position or what do we have to do next? That's a really tough question. Um, I, th I, th I think we, in some cases, were in an in a advantage position, but I do worry that we've done things recently to undermine our own carbon pricing system to really add a lot of noise into that environment, and that the U.S., um, without their national carbon price, of course, there's different, and there's so many complicated systems at the state level, um, and including the IRA, and they're, they're, they're really elegant, this, this production credit, tax credit that they've applied. So I don't know how, um, and even on the data, I don't know how there's going to be like a, I envision in my mind like some kind of machine at the border that, <laughs> that is going, you know, cha-ching, cha-ching, you know, the tax on this uh, MCF of natural gas from the Marcellus is this, and, you know, it's this on a can of Coke or this on an automobile from GM. I don't know how you, how you do that. And in Europe, I think with the EU system, they've got a more consistent regulatory environment and standards. But we're going to have to work it out. And the markets will get there. You know, again, probably the U.S. will figure this out, some kind of enterprising um, data uh, collector out of Seattle will create a market out of something, and it will be discounted in value, and somehow Canada will lose money. That's how I think it's going to not anymore. Someone in this room will invent it now. So, uh, yeah, I think we had a question. At, I don't know what the table is there, but yeah. Hi there. Um, great presentation. And um, I was glad to hear that the carbon border adjustment mechanism was brought up. Um, I'm also wondering about evolutions in the SEC, Canadian securities regulations, EU regulations, and whether or not those are anticipated to perhaps force companies to reveal certain things in a way that might... Um, matter to studies like yours in the future? So that's a, that's a very, very good question. So uh, of course, uh, traditionally, the, all the ESG ratings are based on self-reported data. And God knows what, what kind of things companies are reporting. And so there is, of course, now we, we, we've got to get more and more mandatory reporting, more and more standardized reporting. Uh, this is potentially a very, very important thing. Of course, I mean, sometimes things can be too, too arduous, especially for small and medium-sized companies if the requirements are too high and then it's, oh my God, we need a pe people to do just reporting and we can't afford that. So there has to be some kind of a, a reasonable middle ground. But yeah, we need, we need better, better environmental data, better social data. Uh, it's not so obvious uh, how to do that because these things are a little bit fuzzy, intangible. These are not like accounting numbers that we have done for, for basically for centuries and decades at least. Uh, and even even this questionable how, how good accounting numbers are. Uh, so it, it was just, oh, why don't we just have, have environment reporting than financial reporting? Yeah, because it's a different kind of animal. That's not possible. But we, we should definitely have more more high quality uh, reporting, high quality standards. And, uh, and of course it shows in the, in the ESG ratings, depending on those, uh, who's, who's rating the companies, that the correlations are like 0.3. So they are at least positively correlated. So if, if uh, one agency uh, rates you as a good company, the other one also might, but not necessarily. So there's a lot of divergence for what constitutes good environmental performance, good, what constitutes uh, social performance. And that can be kind of a maddening for, 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 for uh, uh, business professionals. What I'm supposed to be aiming because your raiders, you don't seem to be agreeing at all. So hopefully that is going to go away a little bit, but it's never going to go completely because these are, are not such uh, dry and cut issues. 
Okay, I think we have time for one more question and then pass it off to Jim. So, well, I don't know. Irene had a, we were talking accounting, so. And Jim will cut her off if he's got to close it off. So. Thank you, I'll make it quick. Um, yeah, I mean, I do research in this area too, Mara, on sustainability reporting and the communication. And, you know, we'd like to do Canadian firms, but there's so many firms that do not provide information. And, you know, some of it is not that difficult to calculate, to monetize. That's where the accountants come in. I'm sure they have the ability to do that. But, you know, these decisions are also made by investment analysts based on the information that the company provides. And do you talk to your analyst and say, I saved X amount of dollars on my, you know, environment initiatives or my social in initiatives or whatever it is. And I don't think a lot of companies do that. When they talk to analysts, they just talk about the financial end and they have to talk about these other issues that actually are financially positive for the companies. I'm a true believer in that because I've done enough analysis to show, and it's not every single one, but you know, there are certain issues that are material to every industry and different material items that are specific to certain industries. So the company really needs to look at what their material issues are and make sure that they are communicating, that they are dealing with those in a positive manner and communicate that to the markets as well. So I'd like to hear your opinion about that before Jim takes over. Thank you. Yeah, I'll give it a shot. Um, Two minutes. Okay. Uh, the the um, I think the the investor uh, world is a bit of a a mess right now as it pertains to seeing value in um, environmental performance. There's enough uh, capital out there in certain bespoke areas for companies that do zero environmental reporting, like without a ESG report or so forth. They can still find. Uh, capital and like niche energy funds and that kind of stuff and they're you know I think sometimes if I'm in investor meetings we'll get asked a question oh do you have an ESG report okay yeah, okay check the box that was then that's it meanwhile if you go to like a pension fund like the Ontario healthcare uh, workers for example you'll get an ESG analyst in the room that starts to get into those questions and that's where the long-term investors the ones that are clearly looking at risk as a major part of their decision-making process are going, and they've got highly trained, highly knowledgeable experts. But it's surprising sometimes the amount of, um, the number of big investment firms out there, institutional investors that don't have much capacity in this area. And uh, I read this is spot on, I mean, the communication, and uh, not only marketing, but also communicating with investment analysts is, is the key, that if you have a good story to tell, Share your story with investment analysts. Look at the, this is how much money we're making out of this, and then that's the way of maybe convincing financial markets that this is this is creating value. Great. Well, definitely an interesting discussion, and that's all the time we have, though. So go well, ahead, Jim. <clears throat> let me say, uh, you know, we do a lot of these panels. This is a truly uh, world class. Uh, experts on the panel, thank you so much, Janet and Yerni, for uh, some great uh, discussion. The audience also very engaged. It's clear that we could go on for a lot longer, and if we hadn't promised people we were going to clear out at nine, I would continue because obviously there's lots more to talk about. But let's start. By, I've got a bunch of thank yous, so let's start by thanking Enbridge for putting on this series. <clears throat> And then I, I want to thank our, uh, give another a shout out to our panel, uh, Jenna and Yuri with uh, Niels doing the, a great job of moderating. Thank you so much. As I'm sure you're aware, these things don't just happen on their own. And uh, special thanks to uh, Lasha Hashe and her great team. And uh, actually, there's so many people from the school here, which is wonderful. Thank you to the fa faculty members who have come out to support and people from all parts of the school. Um, Lasha, thanks for organizing this. <clears throat> Uh, 
And of course, the uh, the Weston and uh, the uh, the setup that they've done in the food, uh, which was great. Um, but let me uh, just move on to uh, you've got on your sheets uh, this information on a feedback survey link, which is a great idea. Just um, scan this right now and then you can give us your thoughts so that we make sure the next event is better. And also, uh, there's a, an opportunity here to get involved in our mentorship program, which is very popular. Uh, and uh, I can attest to it because I've done it myself for uh, quite a few years. And uh, there's nothing better than to uh, work with uh, one of the students. So if you enjoyed this event, go to the Haskane webpage, haskane.ucalgary.ca, and uh, scroll to the bottom, and you'll see lots of different events that are coming up. Um, so thank you all for participating. This has been a great audience. I can see you're very engaged in the topic, and that uh, is very heartwarming for us. So thank you. Have a great day, and uh, stay dry.